Ena arke hai ena ha logos kai ha logos en prostan theon kai theos en ha logos. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you love it when uh, the pastor reads from Greek? <laughs> How about this? En principo erat verbum, et verbum erat apudeum, et deus erat verbum. Isn't that beautiful? No? <laughs> Not so much. That's Latin. How about this? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There it is in English. This is uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, if you didn't love the Latin translation, then you ought to be giving a great big hands up, thumbs up to uh, Martin Luther, who uh, translated the Bible into German. Now, he wasn't the first to translate the Bible into a common language, but he was perhaps one of the most influential people to do so. In fact, I read an article uh, in preparation for this sermon that said because of the Bible that he translated into German, the rest of Germany, um, which had been speaking several different dialects, was able to unify and create one solid German language that is still readable today. People in Germany today can still read the old translation of Luther's Bible and say, yep, that's my language. Um, after Luther translated the Bible into German, William Tyndale, who was a contemporary of his, visited from England and looked at the work he was doing and went back and translated a Bible into English. Later, others in England decided that that Bible wasn't still quite reaching enough of the people, and so King James authorized another version to be translated. And then, you know, uh, years and years later, there was another version that came out, the Revised Standard Version, and then there was the new Revised Standard Version, and then there was the new International Version, and uh, there's even a today's new International Version. I'm waiting for the this minute new International <laughs> Version. But um, we have multiple uh, versions of the Bible, hundreds, thousands maybe, of versions of the Bible. You can pull up on your smartphone, um, BibleGateway.com, and instantly access Bibles in nearly any language you want. Luther uh, is the one that we have to, thanks for that, to thank for that in, in large part. He translated the New Testament from Greek into German with surprising speed. The New Testament he was able to accomplish in only 11 weeks. But it took Luther... 12 years to translate the whole Bible. And partly this is because he decided on his own he could not render a faithful translation. So he gathered a group of his friends, very faithful scholars, and they worked together on this um, to put together one whole translation of the Bible. And it took them 12 years. Now that's not 12 years of sitting in front of a computer screen happily typing things. That's 12 years of agonizingly penning a, a, a manuscript, not with a nice ballpoint pen, but with ink and, and retranslating re it. And it's the printers in the printer's office uh, or workshop setting the type letter by letter as they published and put together Bibles. Now, um, there was not... Uh, an easy road from Luther as he did this. Some people objected that he shouldn't be doing this, that the Latin version was such a high and holy and well-respected version that you shouldn't change it or desecrate it by translating it into German the language of the people. You don't do that. And uh, so there was all kinds of pushback, but Luther said, Scripture is worth fighting for. Scripture is something that is so important that we need to push for this and, and work at it. Even if it takes us 12 years, we will continue to press on and try to gain uh, a Bible that can be read by the people. And 
And the article that I read um, even said that Luther wasn't satisfied with just getting it into German. He really wanted to make it a dialect that was spoken and easily understood by a majority of the people. Now, what's really interesting to me is that as you look at the history of how the Bible was put together, um, there's been a constant tug and pull at uh, the translations in trying to make them the language of the people. So um, the, the New Testament was first written in Greek, but not high academic Greek. It's called Koine Greek. And um, a professor for me uh, defined it as street Greek, uh, that it was not, if you look at Homer and Plato and, and the way that they wrote uh, literature or the way that um, the emperors would put out edicts, that that's a different kind of, of Greek that, that was written. The language of the New Testament was the language of the people. It was meant to be easily understood by everyone who heard it. But, you know, after a while, after Greek became the solid translation, people started to elevate it and say it can't be changed. So even after everyone else in the Roman Empire was speaking Latin, the Bible was still written and and copied in Greek. And finally, a man named Jerome came along and put together what we call the Vulgate version of the Bible and said, we need to get it in the hands of the people. We need to get this Bible back into the language that everyone speaks. And so he uh, uh, retranslated the Bible into Latin. But then again, Latin became like, oh, Hi, holy Latin, if that's the language of the Bible, we can't mess with that. Regular people shouldn't be able to understand God's word. We need it to be holy. And so the the Bible, once again, became this thing that no one else could touch. Latin was the Bible language. And so in Luther's day, when you went to church, it was in Latin. And regular folks came and they looked at the pretty stained glass windows and they listened for when the bell rang to see that um, Christ had been transformed in the bread and they came forward when they were supposed to, but they didn't understand what was being said. Now, again and again and again, people have retranslated the Bible into a language that's common. And nearly every time someone says, oh, Eugene Peterson, what are you doing? You're ruining our Bible. Like, oh, I can't believe they made that living Bible paraphrase. It's so bad. Um, And maybe it is a bad translation. Certainly it's a paraphrase. Um, But the reason that people keep translating it is so that it can be the language of the people. And so there are thousands of translations now of the Bible, all meant so that we can access them and understand them. But the question I have for you, the question that we all must wrestle with is, have we done the same thing to our own Bibles? Do we use all of these translations? I have at home probably 20, maybe 30 Bibles, and Uh, Some of them get used. Some of them are taped with duct tape because I use them so much. And some of them sit on the shelf because they're keepsakes. Keepsakes from grandma, keepsakes from grandpa, keepsakes uh, that we don't use because they're holy and precious. And sometimes the Bible, we set it up as though the Bible were God and not, in fact, God's word to us. So how often do we use them? Now, don't think that I don't get it, that when it comes to reading the Bible, sometimes it's confusing. It's full of names that are long and strange, names that are hard to get over and, and around. Some of it, the Bible is violent and frightening, and some of it is downright weird. Have you read Ezekiel chapter 1 lately? It's crazy. Talks about wheels and spinning, and it seems more like science fiction than uh, uh, the Word of God. And so it's hard to uh, understand what it means. Sometimes we think maybe the Bible just got a little lost in translation. 
But in the midst of all of our confusion, in the midst of the confusing passages, I'm reminded of a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, uh, it ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. You see, sometimes we get hung up on all of this stuff that we don't understand and we forget that there's a good deal we do understand and can grasp and can resonate with and can fall in love with. Every once in a while, I come across these stories of people who started reading the Bible and discovered God in a whole new way and found an infectious love of God that they that fires them up and inspires them toward good living and peaceful living. Um, all the time, there are people who are reading the Bible and discovering great joy in its pages. Certainly that happened for Luther as he wrestled with the Bible. He wrote about how he didn't like God before he started studying Romans and teaching it to his students. But somewhere in the preparation of those lessons and the wrestling with the Bible, he discovered God's grace and love for him, and he clung to that and held on to that. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it is, uh, talks about, has that verse in it that's probably familiar to many of you. Thy word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. That verse is in the middle of Psalm 119, uh, verse 105, actually, but it the whole psalm is about how good God's law is, how beautiful the Bible is. And it reminds us that in this word, there is something good, something that connects us to God. John 1, 1 again says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This passage isn't talking about words, like words on the page. It's talking about Jesus, who is God's word revealed to us. And we remember as we read that, that the Bible is not just supposed to teach us about words, but it's supposed to draw us closer, ever closer to Jesus. And so as we seek to understand the Bible and find its meaning, I think it's comforting to read this passage in Romans that we read earlier that shows Paul sort of wrestling with the Bible, wrestling with the law and trying to figure out what does it really mean and what is its value he says, the law sometimes just makes me want to do more bad stuff. When it says, do not covet or do not do this, that's really all I want to do. I want to covet my neighbors, whatever. Um, I want to, to break some of those commandments. But then he says that what the law ultimately does for us is reveal our desperate need for God that we can't ever climb up all of these laws like a ladder to get to heaven, that there is a longing in all of us for life to be good and right. And the law reveals that we desperately need God and desperately need his grace working in us. This is what we are all longing for. And again, this is what Luther was wrestling with. And when he discovered God's grace in the passage of Scripture, he was so desperate to bring it to others that he was willing to fight and sacrifice his life, really, so that others could have this. Now, I know that may seem like I'm being a little dramatic, but really, as Luther um, went through Romans, he came up with a list of things that he thought needed to be changed in the church. And this is what we call famously his 95 Theses, and he tacked them up on the door of the Wittenberg Church. I'm told that um, someone in the first service who'd just been to Germany to visit that church said he didn't tack it with um, a nail and hammers, he tacked it with beeswax. Um, so there's an interesting free tidbit for you. Um, but anyway, uh, he, he tacked it to the door and said, I have discovered that we've been adding, our church tradition has been adding on to the Bible and it's saying that we need indulgences and we need all this other stuff to get to heaven. But really, we only need scripture alone, that God's grace is in these pages and we just need this and we need to be able to read it and grasp it on ourselves, by ourselves. 
And the Catholic Church, the, the authority then, did not like that. And so they pushed at him, put him on trial. They excommunicated him. They could have easily um, uh, had him executed, and they did for some people who were excommunicated. But um, Frederick the Wise, a prince of Germany, which is where um, Luther lived, uh, took him right after the trial was over and uh, hurried him off to Wartburg Castle and sheltered him there. And it was during this time that he translated the Bible. And again, he spent all of that agonizing time. He fought hard for us to have scripture so that we could discover God's grace for ourselves. So here's the thing. Luther spent 12 painstaking years translating the word. And I think some of us struggle to find 12 painstaking minutes to study it. And, and so we need to wrestle with this question of what value do I give the Bible? What value is scripture in my life? How readily and willingly do I come to it and study it? Now, I want to tell you, if you're struggling with this, don't spend 12 years wallowing in guilt about this. If you've gotten stuck and given up reading the Bible, that's okay. It's really okay. Um, try again. Find another translation. Find another study guide. Um, go out and pick up a devotional book. Go out and find something else that you can use, um, a Sunday school class, a Bible study, Find somewhere else that will help you through navigating the Bible, but try again. And while I believe that the details of the Bible are important and that God expects us to use our brain and wrestle with, 12, er, with tough things, if you get stuck on some passage, don't stop reading. Skip it, move on, and, and focus on the good things. Look at the big context and uh, wrestle with that stuff you do understand. I want to leave you with an image, a final image. This is one that I learned at a conference I went to when I was in college in my undergrad. Um, and, and the image was this. They said, imagine yourself as a traveler in the woods, um, wandering through the woods, and you've gotten lost. And it's fall or maybe early winter, and it's starting to get really cold at night, so you're desperate for shelter, right? And as you've gotten lost and you're longing for shelter, way off in the distance you see a cabin, and from the cabin is radiating light, and so you walk toward the cabin and the light, and as you draw closer, you see that the cabin has this huge picture window in the front, and on that picture window, it's all frosted over because it's cold, but there are words that have been written in the window. And you begin to look at the words, and you read the words, and it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. The word was with God, and the word was God. And you marvel at these words, right? And you look at them, and you try to figure out who wrote them on the window, and why did they write them on the window, and maybe even when did they write them on the window, and where did these words come from? And you can spend all night there analyzing the words. But you know what else you can do? You can see through those words. The words have been scratched out through the frost in the window, and if you look through the words, you can see into the room where there's a fireplace. And God is sitting there in the easy chair right in front of the fireplace, maybe with a cup of cocoa. And right next to it is an empty chair waiting just for you. And this is what the Bible is supposed to be for us. That sure, it's words, and the words are good words, and the words are fun to analyze. Maybe not for you, but I like analyzing the words. And they're good words. But beyond the words is where God is sitting. And this is why we read the Bible. This is why we struggle with the Bible, because God is inviting us into the sitting room to begin a relationship with him and to meet him. And so as we look at the words of the Bible this week, I pray that you would continue to see the word, not just the words on the page, but see the word who is Christ our Lord, inviting us into a loving embrace. May you see and receive God's love this week 
as you pressed on towards Scripture alone.